This is going to be a transition series, topics for a paramedic. Uh, topic three, legal issues and EMS. And objectives of this are going to be, we're going to discuss some legal terms commonly associated with EMS laws and regulation, understand patients' rights as applied to emergency and healthcare, identify the patient's or the paramedic's role in organ donation and other special reporting situations in this section. Introduction. Legal issues impact every patient contact. The laws are designed to protect both the patient and the care provider. If paramedics do not adhere to the legislation that they must operate within, severe legal punishment um, may result. There are quite a few terms here, so I'm going to read them all first, and then I'm going to kind of talk about them. <clears throat> uh, scope of practice. We're going to talk about that, negligence, intentional torts, duty to act, ethical behavior, medical direction, good Samaritan laws, sovereign immunity, statute of limitations, and then standard of care. So let's start off with the scope of practice. And scope of practice is kind of something that they look at uh, whenever... What would a person in that state, licensed in that state, do per, uh, put in the same situation? And so what is the standard scope of practice or the standard of care? What were you expected to do would be the version of that. Next thing we talk about is negligence. And you have to have four things proven. There's four elements of negligence. There's a duty to act. There's a breach of that duty. Damages were caused. And because of the breach of that duty, was the direct cause of those damages that are compensatable. Uh, intentional torts. Intentional torts are, there's quite a few of them. They're things like in abandonment, assault, battery, false imprisonment, or defamation. Now, whenever we look at intentional torts, and we do things like battery or assault, I'll talk about this one here. Um, Abandonment is treatment of the patient is stopped prior to the transfer of care. So we had talked about in the last topics that we kind of dropped somebody off and didn't do a transition of care. That would kind of be abandonment. Assault, willful threat to inflict harm. Now, an assault is just the threat, not the actual battery. Uh, so a willful threat to inflict harm. Battery is physically touching the patient unlawfully without the patient's consent. False imprisonment being another one of these intentional torts, which is essentially kidnapping. Intentional loading and transporting of a competent patient without the patient's consent is the definition of false imprisonment or kidnapping. And then last but not least, defamation. Defamation, uh, which would be damaging information to a person's character or reputation, and this is released to the public. Defamation of character comes to mind. Okay, so duty to act. Let's talk about that a little bit. So a professional paramedic has a duty to act. The concept known as duty to act refers to the paramedic's legal obligation to provide emergency care to the patient. You had a duty to act. There was a duty there for you to provide emergency care. Ethical behavior. We'll talk about this here in another slide. Uh, so... This one here, we're going to talk about what our ethics are. What's ethical behavior as far as the UMS goes? Medical direction. Um, medical direction should be contacted whenever we get into the gray areas of legal terms or we get into the gray areas of, of any kind of legal um, binding that would, that would make us liable, if we will. Um, the doctor, very short and sweet, has probably better insurance than we do. And his umbrella is a lot larger, so get his decision whenever it's in the gray areas. Good Samaritan laws are there to kind of protect us. However, they only protect for first aid, and they're kind of there for the unprofessional. Sovereign immunity, talk about that here for a second, or governmental immunity. And about here, governmental immunity kind of protects government-operated EMS services, from anybody suing them. And the sovereign immunity is just for the service. 
not for the actual paramedics that uh, work for that service. Statute of limitations is the time frame that you can be sued or held liable, civilly liable, for uh, a negligence claim. And then the standard of care. Uh, standard of care is expected to be provided by a paramedic with similar training managing a patient in a similar situation. It is what the reasonable person with the same training in the same area would do for a similar event or a similar patient. So there's a lot of situations to where you're going to be called in a court of law uh, to either testify upon the prosecution or the defense, or you may be there because someone is suing you for something. So very simply, we aren't into documentation yet, but most of the time they have your document or your narrative up on the jumbotron, if you will, in front of everybody so that they can see. Be sure your documentation is accurate and correct. Ethics. Branch of philosophy directed towards the study of morals or concepts such as right or wrong. NAMTA has issued a code of ethics for EMS the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians. Ethical decision making should guide your choice, the choices a paramedics make every day. Now, there are some ethical responsibilities of all EMS personnel just in general. Um, the paramedic should provide competent and professional emergency care to every patient. Respect all persons and their rights. They have rights. Everyone has rights. Maintaining professional knowledge and skill mastery. That's also an ethical responsibility of yours. Participating in research and improving patient care outcomes in any way that we can. Upholding all professional standards and conduct. Reporting events thoroughly and honestly. And working harmoniously with other healthcare professionals is our ethical responsibilities. The patient's rights. Every patient that summons EMS has certain rights. These include privacy and confidentiality, access to emergency care, consent, and the ability to refuse care. Um, obviously, HIPAA, privacy and confidentiality, unless it concerns with the continuation of their care, we can't release any of that. And everyone has access to emergency care if you work for a service. Consent. You have to have their consent to actually touch them, or you could be filed. Once you touch them and you put them on the cot, it could be considered battery. Or just the imposing threat of you putting them on the cot could be considered assault. They, you have to have consent to actually do correct things. Now, for everyone, anyone that's wondering, well, what do we do with the person that is not competent or considered competent? and is fighting us. Well, very simply, we have to document very thoroughly why they were not competent. So as long as that is in our narration, and that is according to our current, current protocol that we work under, then that should suffice. Um, ability to refuse care. Whenever someone refuses care, you have to give them informed consent. And what informed consent is, is they are aware that by not going to the emergency room and getting checked out, that they could possibly die. Because you think it might be this. So they have to be educated over that in the words that they understand. The patient refusing care. You should ensure that the patient is legally competent and capable of making an informed decision. If you're unsure about the patient's competency, a good thing to do would be to contact medical direction. If you are required to contact your medical control by protocol, then do so. Inform the patient of the risk, including the possibility of death associated with refusing emergency care and transporting to a hospital. Ask the patient after you've informed them of this, if, are you sure you don't want to go to the hospital one more time? If the patient is competent and still refuses, ask him to sign a refusal form. If possible, get a neutral third-party person to witness the refusal, encourage the patient to call back if anything changes or redial 911 if the symptoms return or develop. Completely and accurately document the entire thing and all aspects of the call. 
Every patient has the right to summon EMS has certain rights. These include advanced directives, organ donation, and transport. Whenever we look at advanced directives, we get into a little sticky area. We have things like living wills, medical power of attorney, and DNRs. Living wills are pretty much legal documents that indicate the patient's decision about the use of long-term life support issues and comfort measures, such as respirators and pain medications and things like that. Those are living wills. Medical power of attorney is a legal document that designates a person, known as a healthcare proxy, to make medical decisions if the patient is unable to do so. And a do not resuscitate order, last but not least, is a written signed request for healthcare providers to withhold resuscitative measures. A DNR order may indicate a variety of detailed instructions for the paramedic to perform or admit, so it should be obtained and considered before beginning any kind of resuscitation efforts. If the DNR order cannot be found immediately, it's best to err on the side of the patient's care and perform all resuscitative measures. You can also involve medical direction with this and get their support and their, their lead on this whole situation. Special reporting situations. EMS providers are legally bound to report certain types of emergencies. These mandatory reporting points vary from state to state. Paramedics should remain abreast of what their state requires and learn the reporting system used. The special reporting situations that are pretty general or pretty, uh, pretty standard as far as state to state goes are suspected abuse or neglect, potential crime scenes, suspected infectious disease exposures, treatment or transport of incapacitated patients, and then dog bites. All of those are pretty much standard as far as reporting situations in, in most states. So long as there is EMS, there will be laws governing EMS. The paramedic is solely responsible for staying abreast of laws that apply to his state. The paramedic should also behave ethically and act in the best interest of the patient. The best defense for preventing a lawsuit is to provide conscientious care to the patient, maintain the standard of care, follow state guidelines, and provide quality documentation on the patient care report. If you have any questions concerning this section, feel free to contact me. My name is Roy Smith. You can be contacted at smithr at or 405-219-7613. Thank you.